Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries. And I want to talk to you about true worshipers this morning. I think, I think that we need to be true worshipers, but I want to talk to you about some things. Here in the Gospel of John, in chapter 4, is Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman at the well. This is an Amplified Bible. It says, but a time is coming and is already here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, from the heart, the inner self, and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. Okay? So I'm using this scripture here because it's saying in there, you know, of such is the Father seeking. He's, he's seeking such people to be worshipers. You know, so at the end, I'm going to ask you the same question I'm going to ask right now, but I'm not going to answer or respond to it. But are you a true worshiper? Well, let's look at some things this morning about true worshipers. First off, the word worshipers comes from a Greek word meaning to adore, okay? Meaning to adore. Now, what does adore mean? The word adore means to love intensely or deeply, okay? So, a true worshiper is somebody who is just adoring the one that they're worshiping, okay? They, they are intensely in love. So, what is a worshiper? A worshiper is a person who wants to be just like the one they are worshiping. You know, I worship God and what I'm saying when I say I worship God is that I want to be like Him. And I know that I'm not, you know, I know I have failures and faults and I understand that, but down inside my heart there's this desire to be like God, to be Christ-like, alright? So it doesn't mean we're going to become gods, believe me, it's not going to happen. You know, but we can desire to be like God. Now, what is God like? Well, He's compassionate. He's merciful. He's loving. You know, He uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, terms and names that describe who God is. But He's also a holy God. And sin, you know, He gets angry at sin, and He gave His Son on that cross. And as brutal as that was, you know, for Christ that and upon Christ, the judgment, you can see just how bad God the Father hates sin. That, you know, it said it pleased God in Isaiah 53, it pleased God to smite his son. And, uh, and that pleasing had to do with how, how much God hates sin and how much, you know, what was required to pay the price. And so it pleased God, meaning that he was able to pour out his wrath on his own son and, 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 the, and judge sin the way it needed to be judged. It said he was beat more than any man. He was marred more than any man. I mean, almost unrecognizable. I mean, he went through, through little hell on earth. Hell itself was unleashed upon him. Demons attacked him using people to do it. You know, and on and on it goes on how vicious... God hates, you know, how much God hates sin, how vicious that, that judgment was upon Christ. You know, even other people, the two guys, one on each side of him, would not beat nowhere near what he was beat. I mean, <clears throat> they were punished, of course, but not like they did Christ. I mean, they, the devils were allowed to attack him in such a way that he was, he was almost unrecognizable, like I said. Okay, so a true worshiper is, is trying to be just like that person, or they have a desire to. You know, when you think about when a person worships another person, a good singer or something, they, might, they say, oh, I wish I could sing like them. You see, they have that desire. You know, that's a form of worship. Now, I know they're not bowing down, maybe, maybe some do, but they're not necessarily bowing down or, or so forth and just, you know, just falling on their knees in front of a singer, but they're thinking on the, they're thinking on the inside of themselves how wonderful that person sings, okay? Which isn't, isn't wrong to honor someone, and it isn't necessarily worship, but 
it's, it's a progression. It's like the step, the next step is worship type of thing. So to worship God, we want to be like him. You know, the scripture says that we, we are witnesses on this earth, okay? By the life that we live, we will be in a living witness. People are looking at us. We say we're Christians. And they're looking at what we're doing and how we talk and kind of words that come out of our mouth and our attitude towards things or, you know, and what, and what we're exalting above. You know, I got a couple of thoughts in my mind, which I don't think it's, it's particularly sinful, but like um, when you're wearing a football jersey during football season honoring some guy on a football team, I mean, that to me is like a step, be, you know, before you actually start worshiping football players or baseball players or whatever, and you're wearing a jersey that's got the name and you're coming to church to worship Jesus, you know? So, I mean, I just have, I have my a little problem with it, but that's just my pet peeve, okay? It's just the way that I am. And uh, so, you know, if we're worshiping God, I mean, put on a Christian t-shirt that honors God and uh, whatever. So, you've got to start understanding what worship is all about. You know, we could be worshiping people. We could be worshiping animals. We could be worshiping things. We could be worshiping vacations. We could be worshiping anything. We want to be just part of this world is a form of worship. So, now true worshipers, a true worshiper is a person who wants their minds to be transformed, okay? They do not need to be commanded. In other words, I don't need God to command me to worship. And I don't think that he actually does that scripturally. We can read it, uh, worship and it's, it's, it's set as a, as a command. But basically God's not going to command us to worship. We are commanded to praise, you see. But we are not basically commanded to worship. Worship has got to be, to be true worship, it's got to be free will. All right? It's you deciding that you want to worship and not being forced to do it. Here in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, Paul is pleading, all right? He's not commanding, he's pleading. Now that word plead, coming from a Greek word, basically is saying, um, let me convince you about worship, all right? Let me convince you about how important it is for you to freely worship. And so, right here we can, we can read that Paul is saying that how the kind is he will find acceptable you know we lay our lives down as living sacrifices and uh, this is the truly the way to worship him with everything we are okay now don't copy now look what it says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world so that's what I'm talking about a worshiper wants to be like the one that they worship and so right here Paul saying don't be like don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Okay? So, Paul right here is saying what I just finished saying about a true worship wants to copy, wants to do what the one that they worship in. I want to be like God. I'm not trying to be equal to God. I'm just trying to be like God. You know, I, God is loving. I want to be loving. God is merciful. I want to be merciful. You know, God cares. I want to care. And on and on it goes. I want to have the same attributes <clears throat> that God has, okay? God is love. I want to be love. I want to <clears throat> be loved by showing love, 
by caring, by um, there's just so many ways that you can love, by being a giver, by feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, you know, on and on I can go. But we need to have that transforming in our mind. Because there's a thought that's in the church world today, and that thought is to not be like God, but to have all the blessings, you see, so we want to we want to go to church, we want to praise God, we want to give our money and all this stuff because we want to be blessed. Alright? So really there, the worship is not the worship of God, but it's really the worship of self. And so we need, that's a worldly type of worship. Because the world out there loves themselves. Okay, everything that they do is to please themselves. But a true worshiper wants to please God. We want to please the one we worship. We want to be like Him. Okay? We want to be able to be a witness of Him. We don't want to have our pride all puffed up to where we want everybody to notice us. So like John the Baptist said, he said, I must decrease and Christ must increase. And so we, that's what true worship is all about. Okay? A true worshiper comes into the light. They do not run from it. All right? A person that wants to get changed into God's image knows that he needs to come into the light. All right? So let's look at some stuff here in John 3. It says, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. The light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God okay so what he's saying here is that a person who becomes a Christian wants to come into the light, okay? I want, to, I want to come into the light so that the light shows my sin and shows the problems and wrong things that's inside of me. So coming to the light is actually worship, all right? Because it's transforming us. It's changing us. So. As, as the writer John here is writing that they ran away from the light because the light's going to reveal the darkness that's inside of us. It's going to reveal the things that are not Christ-like. So a true worshiper is going to come into the light. When you, when you start worshiping God, you are coming into the light. You see, you can go to church and you can be a believer. In, the, in uh, the epistle of James, James said, you say you believe, that's good, but your belief is not any greater than a demon. It said that, you know, the, even the devils believe and they tremble, all right? So we got to go beyond that. When Jesus was teaching, he was saying, you have to go beyond the righteousness of the Pharisees, okay? Because they were doing everything to be seen and to be puffed up. So all these different teachings are telling us that we have to go past praise. God deserves to be praised, okay? Every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, we're going to be forced to praise. The demons are going to praise, all right? The unsaved are going to be forced to praise and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. But a true worshiper goes beyond. I mean, Jesus, all his teachings were really teaching about worship. He said, if someone... You know, some soldier forces you to go one mile. Well, don't let him take advantage of you. Go two miles. You see? So he's telling us that praise is like going to one mile, which is good. But worship goes two miles. Okay? So there's all kinds of stories. There's a story about the, um, the man who had a bumper crop and all his barns were full. So the Lord was waiting to see what this guy would do. And instead of giving away all his excess food, because he had so much, 
He built, he tore his barns down and built bigger ones. You see, the Lord, the Lord wants us to get out of that, you know, put things away for a rainy day attitude. And, and the only way you're going to be able to do that is to be a worshiper so that you have the peace of God. Just like he told a rich young ruler, he said, go and sell everything you got and give it to the poor and come and follow me. You know, it's, people are not going to be able to sell all they got on their own free will. You see, I mean, I'm not saying you have to do this, but a true worshiper begins to trust in the Lord. And that true worshiper, after he's just worshiping continuously, will be able to do anything, to leave the comforts of home and go be a missionary in some third world country, or to, you know, sell what they have and give it to the poor, or whatever, to be able to do whatever Christ requires of them. So this is what worshipers do. They come into the light, and the light will transform us. You see, light turns darkness into light. It turns it into a vision. You could see it because of the light. And so when the light comes into our hearts and shows us the things that are wrong, we're going to want to change. We're going to want to, to be a worshiper. We want to, we want to change into his image. A true worshiper is always learning about things that please the Lord. They do not have to be told to learn. You know, as a pastor, I'm striving and trying to get people to study the Word. You know, I'm sure people are tired of hearing me say that. But that's, that's me. I'm a teacher, I'm a preacher, and I'm a pastor. And, and I want people to study because they're, they're going to get themselves out of their dilemmas by studying because they'll start learning the Scriptures, you know, to better their own lives. And so I want people to succeed. God wants us to succeed, you know, in Him. But a true worshiper, um, they're always learning about things that please the Lord, okay? And they don't have to be told, you need to go learn. They're learning. They want to know. They're in love with God, okay? And, they're, and that love for God, they want to become more like Him. They want people to know Him. Here in Ephesians 5, in the Amplified, it says, For once you were darkness, okay, once you were in the world, once you were unsaved, but now you are light in the Lord. So now, you see, you are reflected light of who He is. You are a witness for the Lord. So it says, Walk as children of light. Live as those who are native born to the light. For the fruit... The effect, the result of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Okay? So if you back up, true worship is always learning. Okay? The things that please the Lord. So Paul writes and he says, For once you were of darkness of the world, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, as those who are native born to the light. For the fruit, the effect, the result of the light consist in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So he's saying you need to walk in the light. You need to walk where the light is shining. It's revealing truth to you, okay? So that's what Christ has come to do. Now, if we don't want the truth of God, if we don't want to study and learn, well the light's not going to shine on that. And if, you, and if it is shining, He's not making you aware that it's shining because you don't want it. Okay? you got a free will. You can decide if you want it or not. And if you want it, then you're going to walk in the light. And how do we walk in the light? Well, it's worship. You see, worship brings us into the light. We're going to see that in just a minute with the scriptures I got on the Holy of Holies. But to bring us into the light, person needs to worship. The scripture says, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. So we come into the gates, into the kingdom, and into you know, salvation and so forth with thanksgiving. You know, repentance and thanking God for his forgiveness. And then we enter into uh, his courts with praise. If you, you know, we, we come into God's presence with praise. 
But then they got a place called the Holy of Holies. And when the high priest would go into that place with the blood of a goat and, uh, and bring that in there and so forth, and a bull, and he went in with incense, which is praise and worship, he would bring that in. And the Lord would bring him in by his grace. He would be transformed and be brought into the, into the Holy Holy. Okay? So once we were children of darkness, but now we're supposed to be children of light. What does that mean? It means we want the light. We want to know truth. Do you desire truth today? Do you want to understand the Bible? Do you want to understand, you know, what the words are saying in the scriptures? Or do you just read it and you don't understand but you don't even care? You know? In other words, they're like, it's like there's no light. It's like you're reading the Bible in darkness. See, I wouldn't read my Bible in darkness. I got a lamp that has three lights on it. So when I sit there under those three lights, I see very well. And uh, that's just a physical thing. But spiritually, I want as much light. I want as much understanding as I read the word as I possibly can get. You know, I'm reading a, a new translation of the Bible. It's like 63 translations, and, and I'm about halfway through, and I think they'll make more before I reach the end. But I like reading different translations because they bring like a, a, new, a new viewpoint of the Scripture. I'm not saying you have to do what I'm doing. All I'm saying is, is that, that uh, you know, I'm just asking the question. Do you want to understand the Scriptures? Do you want to know the truth? So, you know, the veil was rent. The way into the Holy of Holies is now available. That's where worship brings us. And that's where the mercy seat is. The revelation of God's forgiveness and His truth is there. You see, everything, everything about God is in the Holy of Holies. That's where His presence resides. Now the Holy of Holies is in my heart. So I need to enter in into my heart. That means I need to believe. I need to use my faith. Okay? So that's what worship is all about. Verse 10 says, <clears throat> Trying to learn by experience what is pleasing to the Lord and letting your lifestyles be examples of what is most acceptable to Him. Your behavior expressing gratitude to God for your salvation. Do you have an expression? That's worship. Do you have an expression of your gratitude for your salvation? Do not participate in the worthless and unproductive deeds of darkness, but instead expose them by exemplifying personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character. All right? So, trying to learn. You know, you we there's no way in the world that we're going to understand God's Word. We can understand the English translation of it. We know what some English words mean. But for us to truly understand the heart of the Word of God, Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible is a written Word of the God. But Jesus is the true Word of God. And so when we read in the written Word of God, then we need to have the Holy Spirit to help us to understand the written word so we can enter the heart of Jesus Christ. What does the scriptures really mean? There's all kind of debates and fights and arguments going on out there on which translation is the best one and so forth. You know, I mean, the, all the translations that I've read so far all point to Christ, okay? They all point to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because He is the Word of God. Gospel John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, okay? So, trying to learn by experience, okay? Experience. That means, as you experiencing other people who worship, as you're experiencing stories and maybe books about worship, as you're experiencing what you, what you see, then, then we are learning. Experience from reading the Word and, and, and beginning to understand it about the light. 
You know, what is pleasing to the Lord. A true worshiper knows that the place to be is in the Holy of Holies. And he also knows that the only way there is to worship. Okay, when we see that high priest in that Old Testament, and we read about how he would uh, go in with the blood of these animals, and he went in with a censer with, with incense on it, it was made by four very hard to get ingredients. To love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is a picture of those ingredients, okay? Then mixed with salt. That salt is a preservative. That your true love is preserved in heaven by God. And that you are preservative from judgment because of God's love upon this earth. So we have this picture of the high priest gone in once a year. But now the veil has been torn. And the holy place that had the menorah, the candle opera there, and the, and the showbread table with the twelve loaves of bread, and the golden altar right in front of the veil, is now you can walk right on in because the veil's been torn. It got torn when Jesus died on the cross, and the veil was rent in two. And now the way unto the Holy of Holies, anyone can come, any time, day or night, because we have the blood of the Lamb, okay? And we have this incense, which is worship rising up to the Lord. It's the prayers of the saints. It's worship and adoration and praise. Because it's rising up and God is breathing it in as a sweet savor. And we have a high priest that went in once and for all. And he's saying, come. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And he's saying, come on in. Don't, don't stay outside. Come on in. Come on in and experience all that I paid for on that cross. The cross is the altar of the sacrifice, okay? So, true worshiper knows the place to be is in the Holy of Holies. Here in Hebrews 9 it says, By these regulations, okay, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented was still in use. So, until Jesus Christ came, that old system was there, and only that high priest could go in once a year. Alright? So, all those regulations was a picture for us about what has happened, what Jesus did for the new covenant to be established. Verse 9 says, this is an illustration pointing to the present time, to where we are right now, the new covenant. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences, the consciences of the people who bring them. So, only all, all that could happen with that high priest was that when it was accepted on that mercy seat, the blood, okay, and the incense and so forth, in the Holy of Holies, once a year on the Day of Atonement, Israel's sins got covered for one year. Adam and Eve came out of the garden, and God killed animals and covered them with their skin so they would not be naked, <clears throat> so that their sin would not be exposed before God. But now Jesus, who is our Lamb, He's the Passover Lamb of God, we are now clothed upon with his righteousness. We are now clothed upon with his light and his glory. So now, he doesn't have to die over and over again. Our sins aren't covered. They are washed away. They are forgotten. Even our new sins, after we've been saved, when we repent, is taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. It's removed. Jesus does not have to die on that cross over and over again. Lambs had to die every year, over and over again, to cover the people. We're not covered. We're not covered, you know, by his blood. We are forgiven and washed clean by his blood. So we repent of, of new sins that makes us dirty. And First John says we repent and confess them. He's faithful and just to, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. Because the price was paid by Jesus. But you have to repent. Repent is another form of worship. 
There's a revival taking place right now in Kentucky and uh, in, a and in a university. It's been going on about 11 days now. And the main thrust of this revival is repentance. God's presence came down. People from all over the world and all over the United States are gone. It's lines that are blocks long. People trying to get in. So people are hungry for a real move of God. And one of the symbols, one of the, one of the things that makes it real is that the people are repenting. They're repenting. You see, they're worshiping God. See, these are Christians that were in a, they were in a chapel service that never ended. So they were Christians. They went to a chapel service. And then the Holy Ghost came down into the place. And they began to repent. Repent is worship. Repentance needs to happen. There's doctrines out there that say you don't have to repent, you're already saved. Let me tell you something, you better repent. When you fail God and do sin and the Holy Spirit convicts you, you need to repent. Because it's kind of like God wants you to come into the Holy of Holies, but sin will keep you out. See, that was the whole thrust of what the high priest was doing. Taking care of the sin issue. Jesus took care of the sin issue. But that doesn't mean that when you sin, it's been taken care of. No, when you sin, the Holy Spirit will convict us. We repent. That's another form of worship. Say, I want to be sinless. I want to be like Christ. And so I need to repent of my sins. See, I'm not, Christ was perfect. He was tested and tempted and he didn't fail. He didn't sin. But I fail. And so the Holy Spirit convicts me, but I want to continue to be like Christ. So I repent and those sins are washed away. Now I'm back being Christ-like because I have no sin. Does that make any sense? I hope that makes sense to you. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies. Physical regulations that were in effect only, watch this, only until a better system could be established. It's the new covenant. That's the better system. We couldn't even go into the Holy Holies back in that day. Not even the priest. Only the high priest could go in once a year. The people had to wait at the, at the front door by the brazen altar where that was set up. They couldn't even come in. They would, have been, they would have probably been killed, you know. And they had to bring an animal. And that animal had to represent their sin and get killed and put on the altar and so forth. Okay? Not anymore. The new system, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has paid the price. Now, how do we enter in? How do we, how do we do all that thing that was a picture of that old system? Worship. Okay? Thanksgiving for our sins. Praising Him for forgiveness. And then worshiping. Worshiping is when your mind gets changed and transformed to copy him to be in his image. You're not even worshiping, I don't think, until you start wanting to be like him. You know, when you worship in the Lord, you enter praise. You know, we call it worship, but when we're singing or whatever, but when you really start worshiping, it praise goes to the next level. And really what we're saying is, I want to be like you. I want to be sinless. I want to be perfect like the scripture tells me. I desire to be Lord. So they may know you. By seeing me in this world they might know you. A true worshiper is a person who tries to do God's will as best as he can. You know we can only do the best we can. If we're doing the best we can then the Holy Spirit will take it further. You know, Jesus Christ lived 100% perfect, okay? I might only live 1%. And as I continue to grow in the Lord, I might move, it might have moved up to 10%. But in the eyes of God, long as I stay busy trying to do my best, I stay at 100% because God gives me, if I'm only doing 10%, He gives me 90%. You understand? In other words, Christ, Christ is going to fulfill all the emptiness, all the lack, 
all the weaknesses. He's going to be our strength. And as we worship is where we get transformed, you see. As we truly worship. Only in the Holy of Holies did God's forgiveness come and, and God then would cover Israel. But it was in the Holy of Holies. It wasn't in the holy place where the golden altar was. It wasn't back in the brazen altar. But it was in the Holy of Holies that Israel got their sins covered for a whole year. So when you, when you repent, you're entering, you're being brought in by the Holy Spirit into the Holy of Holies. Where the mercy seat is. To get your forgiveness. Okay? So, re worship is like, it's, it's what makes everything happen. Okay? It's just, a person is truly worshiping when he's trying his best, and then the Holy Spirit does the rest. Hope that makes sense. Here in John 9 it says, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God, he hears him. Now, this is the blind man that got healed in John chapter 9. And the Pharisees brought him in and they questioned him. And he's saying, that's pretty weird that you don't even know who this guy is. So this, this blind man starts to teach the Pharisees. And he says, since the world began... It has been unheard of that anyone open eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. But notice what he says up here. He says, now we know that God does not hear sinners. The only thing he's going to hear from a sinner is their repentance and their faith and belief in Christ when they open their mouth and confess. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, that person hears him. You know, when a person begins to repent, God hears him. When, God begins, when a person begins to worship, God hears his worship. Okay? So, finally the Pharisee said, You know, who are you? Who are you? you? You can't teach us. And they kick him out of the synagogue. And he goes back and he falls down and worships before Christ who reveals himself as the Messiah. Okay? So, but right here, that... That blind man who was blind from his birth has a revelation that the Pharisees did not have. Because see, you don't have to have natural sight to enter the Holy of Holies. You need to have spiritual sight to enter in by the blood of the Lamb. A true worshiper has the kind of faith that pleases God. In Hebrews 11, 6, this is in J.B. Phillips' New Testament, okay, it says, It was because of his faith, we're talking about Enoch, okay, that Enoch was promoted to the eternal world without experiencing death. He disappeared from this world because God promoted him, and before that happened, his reputation was that he pleased God. We'll pause right there for a second. Now, Enoch, it's not a whole lot about him. He's mentioned in the book of Jude definitely mentioned over in the book of Genesis and, men, and mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And he's mentioned as being one that pleased God. He would go up in the mountain, just like Jesus would go up into a mountain and pray. He would leave this world behind. He didn't have nothing to do with this world. He just was a person who he sought after God. And he went up on this mountain and one day when he went up he never came back. They searched for him and he had he had gone. His body was gone. God took him. Took him. Not, not out of his body, but in his body. Okay? So, then it goes on. The writer of Hebrews writes, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. So he's saying that he had this to say about himself, that he pleased God. Okay? And it says, And without faith, it's impossible to please him. The, the man who approaches God, which is what Enoch did, must have faith in two things. First, that God exists. And secondly, that it is worth a man's while to try to find God. Okay? So, you've got to have these two things if you want to please God. First, you've got to believe He exists. And then because you believe He exists... 
then you have to believe that it's worthwhile to worship. Let me tell you something. Worship's going to take your whole being. Praise will take your mind and your lips. But worship takes your heart. <clears throat> it takes your whole physical life. You know, you might shake. You might cry. You might have your hairs stand up on edge as you worship and come into his presence. But it's going to involve your whole body. It's going to involve everything about you. But praise only does, <clears throat> excuse me, a portion of your body, your brain. Maybe some of your heart too, as you believe. So right here, it's telling us how Enoch pleased God. He pleased God by going off alone to find God. And then what did he do when he got there? Well, he probably worshipped. Because he was now in God's presence. Let me ask you a question. I asked this at the beginning. Would you consider yourself a true worshiper? Do you worship? Do you consider yourself a true worshiper? So everybody that's listening to this, this is a question to you. So, uh, this is my definition of a true worshiper. Now, a true worshiper to me is not someone who attends a worship service. They could be. A true worshiper could be. He is a worship service. Okay? So, a true worship is, isn't necessarily someone who intends a worship service, but he is a worship service himself. So what I'm saying is, is that I can go to what's called a worship service, and I might begin to worship. A worship service doesn't even have to have music or singing. You see, I myself, alone with God, I become a worship service when I worship. Now what do I mean by worship service? I mean that I'm serving the Lord. That he deserves to be worshipped. There's a story in, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke. I believe it's in chapter 17. And it talks about the unworthy servant. It just talks about the man who goes out. And he does everything that he's to do because he's a servant. And when he's finished, he comes in. And Jesus said, does he go and feed himself? He said, no. He only did what he was hired to do. So what does he do? First, he serves his master. He serves the person who hired him. So he waits patiently as he serves that master his food. He's serving the master. And then when he's done, and the master is full, then the servant eats. It's a picture of worshiping God, not because we want something, you see. I'm worshiping God, I'm serving the Lord, I am my own worship service. Understand? So I don't need to go to a worship service. I am a worship service, or I am a servant who worships, who serves the Lord in worship. So what does the Lord want today? What does he, what, what should be in that plate that the servant feeds his master? Faithfulness, love, worship, praise, adoration, thanksgiving. You see, all of that should be in the plate that we're feeding our Lord with. <clears throat> Giving him new wine. New wine, you know, that the master wants to drink. You know, it's new wine to us is Jesus' blood, life. Well, he wants you to give him, give him your life. The life that he's given to you. Use your life to honor him and worship him. You know, go out there and serve. That's what, it, that's what the servant did. This is our job to be a witness. To love the unlovable. To clothe the naked. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Day of the Lord. To go out and, and do what we're hired to do. We've been given salvation to go out and do something with it. 
But when we come back into worship, don't come back and say, I witnessed for you today. I want a blessing. No. Come back in and worship. Feed the Lord with what He wants. Tell Him how wonderful He is. See, I can't command you to do that, and I can't show you any commands to do that. All I can do is, like Paul said, you know, I just, I just, I just want you to be aware of it. I just want you to know what true worship is. You know, if you go in and start saying, Lord, I need this, I'm sick of my body, I need a healing, and on and on it goes, you're not worshiping. You know, you're making your quest known unto God. You're at the front gate, you know, waiting for your prayers to be answered so you can enter in with thanksgiving. True worship. You know, are we true worshipers? I'm going to pray for you this morning. And I, I want to pray and hope that you understood the message. I really want you to understand how, how important it is for your being of who you are. That you worship the creator of all things. That you worship him in spirit and in truth. Because the Lord's seeking you if you are. And he knows where you are. And then he's going to begin to do things with you. To be a witness to this world. And then when you go home, you'll hear, well done, a good and faithful servant. Everybody starts out in salvation, and then we should progress into worshipers. So Father, I just pray right now for every individual that's listening. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring understanding to them as I tried my best to make it clear and understood that we should want to be Christ-like, sinless, and walk uprightly and serve you before we ask for anything. So I lift them up and pray that the blessing of understanding will come upon them. In Jesus' name, amen.